Hello, friends. Late last year at Nationals in Dallas, a guy came up to me and told me that he's starting a paddle company called Chorus and sent me home with a prototype. I didn't think much about it at the time, but earlier this year, he sent me the production model. And when my podcast co-host Eddie and I tested it, we were both impressed. And the more we hit with it, the more impressed we became, which brings us to now where both of us had been maining the shapeshifter for about a month. So what is it about this paddle that would convert two people who hit with dozens of paddles every week? Stick around and find out because we're going to break down all the performance metrics like spin, hand speed, control, power, and pop. I'll also cover the materials and manufacturing process of the paddle and how everything comes together on the court during gameplay. And stick around to the end of the video when I explain how I modified the paddle to really get its performance dialed in. The Shapeshifter costs $190, and you can take 10% off that with the code JOHNQ, bringing the price down to $171. And if you're interested in this paddle, there's good news. Chorus just got a new shipment of these in today after selling out of their first batch. This is a hybrid shape paddle, so it's in between elongated and wide body. The shape is very similar to the Diamond Series by 6.0, and it includes a slight flare going up the paddle face. The advertised dimensions are 16.3 inches long by 7.7 inches wide, although all of mine are slightly wider, right at the 7.75 inch mark. Handle length is 5.5 inches and handle circumference is 4.25 inches. Speaking of the handle, the batch that's being released today and all future runs will have a standard grip without the ribbing that you see here that was on the first run. The new grips are flat and perforated, but the perforation holes are smaller than what you see on gamma paddles, for example. Okay, so let's dive into the performance metrics. The boxes up at the top of this graphic give you the raw numbers and the radar chart on the bottom shows where those numbers fall in terms of percentiles for all 185 paddles in my database. Also, this is a newly reconfigured chart to make it more easily digestible at a glance. The left side of the chart is comprised of power, pop, and swing weight, which together give you an idea of the paddle's firepower. High values on the left side of the chart mean the paddle's a heavy hitter. Spin and twist weight are on the top right of the chart, and these relate to a paddle's control and forgiveness. A larger twist weight and high spin help you to control the ball better, so high values in this area of the chart typically mean a paddle has good control. And the bottom of the chart has swing weight and balance point, which together give you an indication of the maneuverability and hand speed of a paddle. Swing weight also correlates to power, which is why it's situated over on the left. But a low swing weight, especially when combined with a lower balance point, means a paddle is quick in the hands. So you can see right away that there's a really good balance all around for the shapeshifter. Every metric falls near the middle and slightly above average, ranging from the 57th percentile for swing weight up to the 76th percentile for power. So this is a fingerprint of an optimized all-court paddle. There's no single metric that's crazy high or crazy low. The top three percentiles on the shapeshifter belong to power, pop, and spin, but these are only modestly above the others. There's a great balance of power and pop on the left side of the chart, as well as for the control metrics on the right. And the bottom of the chart indicates moderate hand speed and maneuverability. So let's compare the power of the shapeshifter to other popular paddles out there. Also, I'm rolling out a new metric called firepower, which includes both power and pop. The reason I'm doing this is because both of these metrics contribute to how hot a paddle feels. You feel power the most at the baseline on big drives and serves, and you feel pop the most at the kitchen on speed ups and counters. But a paddle with a lot of one and not much of the other just doesn't compare to one that's stacked on both metrics. So the firepower metric combines the power and pop percentiles of the paddle and converts it to a score from zero to 100 with 100 having the most firepower and zero having the least. For example, the delisted Yola Gen 3 paddles and the Gearbox Pro Power all have the largest firepower scores at 90 and above as you would expect. 
If you want to see how this metric stacks up against over 100 paddles, I've updated my paddle database at johnqpickleball.com. The firepower score of the Shapeshifter is 73, which puts it in the above average category. And this skews slightly in favor of power over pop, but it's not a large differential, so both power and pop are well balanced. The firepower and balance of power and pop on the Shapeshifter are most similar to other popular paddles, such as the Pickle Hurricane Pro 16mm and the Gearbox Pro Control Elongated. Okay, so before we look at how all these metrics translate to actual performance on the court, let's touch on the materials and technology used for the Shapeshifter. The Shapeshifter is unibody and thermoformed, meaning it's put into a mold with edge foam surrounding a polypropylene core and then sealed with a band of carbon fiber surrounding the entire perimeter all the way down through the handle. Then it's cured with heat and pressure, producing a stiffer paddle with a larger sweet spot and more power and pop. The facing material on the Shapeshifter is 18K woven Torre carbon fiber, giving it that 3D cubed effect. The exact effect on the performance of the paddle of this 18K triaxial weave up to now is largely unknown, but any kind of woven cloth on the surface does tend to give the paddle a more plush feel because there's more give in a weave than in solid sheets of unidirectional filaments. To me, the face of the Shapeshifter feels slightly softer than traditional Gen 2 thermoformed raw carbon fiber paddles, but not as soft as Gen 1 paddles or some of the softer Kevlar varieties like the Ruby or the original Apes Pro-Line Energy. The surface layup on the Shapeshifter gets more interesting as you go from top to bottom, which is comprised of the 18K triaxial cloth on top, then a layer of unidirectional carbon fiber in the middle, and then finally a layer of unidirectional fiberglass on the bottom, oriented 90 degrees to the carbon fiber. The theory behind this layup is that the top two layers of carbon fiber, so that 18K triaxial cloth and the unidirectional layer below it, give you a softer, more muted response on top. And then the bottom layer of fiberglass provides added power on shots that are hit harder and sink further into the face, activating that fiberglass on the bottom. From the feel of this paddle during gameplay, I do think there's something to this claim. It does feel more control oriented with softer shots and power and pop are there when you take more forceful swings. And if you don't believe that a paddle face can bend enough to activate the bottom layer of the layup, check out this ultra slow motion clip shot at 20,000 frames per second. This is Isaac, Chris Olsen's brother, hitting a ball with the bread and butter filth. Check out not only the compression of the ball, but also how the surface layers on the paddle bend and pocket that ball and then rebound it. Now, clearly this kind of dwell time is nothing compared to a tennis racket or anything out there with strings, but it's still there and it shows that the facing materials and core all play a role in a paddle's performance. The texture of the Shapeshifter is created with a peel ply, which is a cloth that leaves behind a layer of epoxy embossed with the weave of that cloth that's then peeled away after curing. Under a microscope, you can see that they're using a coarser weave that's one of my favorites and seems to provide better spin and resist wear longer than other textures. That's not to say that this texture won't wear down. It will, and eventually it'll lose its spin potential. But like I said, this particular texture pattern seems to create spin and hold up a little better than others. On the court, the shapeshifter performed about like what I would expect given the metrics that I presented earlier, but this is definitely a paddle where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Looking at the radar chart from earlier, yes, it's neat that all these metrics are so close to each other and all slightly above average, but this particular combination of attributes really creates an exceptional paddle. It's not gonna do anything crazy for you, like hit serves at 100 miles an hour or reset every ball perfectly every time, but it's definitely one of the most well-rounded paddles on the market. I mean, there's really nowhere on the court where you can't play confidently with this paddle. So baseline, transition zone, kitchen, defense, offense, neutral exchanges, 
This pedal does it all well, and it allows you to just trust your equipment and focus on the game. So if you miss a shot, don't stare at your paddle like it's at fault. That's all on you, or maybe the bull. And that's a nice place to be in a saturated paddle market that can be a little overwhelming and is definitely experiencing some polarization and chaos right now. Like I mentioned earlier, the paddle feels more muted and controllable with softer shots like resets, drops, and dinks. I definitely noticed a higher margin on my third shot drops right away when I started playing with the Shapeshifter. And that's comparing apples to apples with other hybrid paddles. So the Shapeshifter gave me more confidence working my way through the transition zone and at the kitchen. At the same time, it's not lacking in power at the baseline or for putaways, and the pop is there too for speed ups and counters at the kitchen. Now, does the power and pop compare to the Yola Gen 3s or the Gearbox Pro Powers? No, definitely not but it's still above average, and so is the control on this paddle, which is a rare combination. The stock shapeshifter plays great, and honestly, it probably doesn't need any modification for the majority of players out there. It's already well balanced right out of the box and ready to go. But I'll present here how I modified it and how that affected its performance in case anyone else wants to experiment. The stock weight for the Shapeshifter is 117, which is just over the 116 average for hybrid shaped paddles in my database. And my preferred swing weight is 118, so I started messing around with the perimeter weighting on this paddle until I found a winning formula, which actually ended up being a little higher swing weight than my standard 118. I'm using two products here. So tungsten tape from Pickleball Effect and a weighted handle cap from Slice. I'll link to both of those products in the description. I started with just tungsten tape at various positions, but I found that adding the Slice handle cap allowed me to bring the swing weight up higher without making the paddle feel slower in the hands. The reason is that by adding weight to the very bottom of the paddle, it lowers the balance point, which helps to kind of counteract that sluggish feeling you get when adding weight to a paddle. What I landed on is a combination of the slice cap in the handle and two five inch strips of tungsten tape starting just above the grip and extending just below the halfway point up the face of the paddle. This is the 0.5 grams per inch tape, so it adds a total of five grams. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the stock and modified shapeshifter. You can see that all the weight modifications boosted most of the metrics on the radar chart, including power, pop, twist weight, and swing weight. The swing weight came up to 121, but like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't feel this high because the slice cap dropped the balance point so much. You can see on the chart that the balance point is nearly completely carved away, dropping from the 60th percentile stock down to the second percentile with modifications. So you're getting perks and power, pop, and stability with the added weight without sacrificing too much in terms of hand speed and maneuverability. To me, this really opened up the Shapeshifter's potential as a very well-rounded all-court paddle with plenty of stability and forgiveness, a wide sweet spot, and offensive options anywhere on the court. So to wrap this up, the Shapeshifter gets very high marks from me for its all-court sensibility, doing everything well without going too far in any direction, which always comes with trade-offs. If this is starting to sound like my recent review of the Honolulu J2K, there are some similarities, but also there are some differences. So let me briefly compare these two. In their stock form, these paddles are very similar with the J2K having a slightly lower swing weight and the Shapeshifter having slightly more pop. But after modification, the J2K shifted slightly more toward the control side of the spectrum and the Shapeshifter shifted toward more power. I think it's because the Shapeshifter has that layer of fiberglass on the bottom of the layup, which the J2K doesn't. And the added weight gave it more plow through, which allowed the ball to kind of sink into the face a little more and then activate that fiberglass layer. So next I wanna experiment using the heavier one gram per inch tungsten tape in the same locations, which would basically double the perimeter weight from five to 10 grams for the tungsten, and then we'll kind of see if the paddle's potential opens up even more or if the swing weight trade-off is too much. So in my opinion, the Shapeshifter is one of the best all-court paddles currently on the market. 
In fact, I like it so much that it's been my main paddle for a month now, and that's unlikely to change anytime soon. So this paddle's sensible combination of performance metrics may not jump out at you on paper, but its unique combination of materials, weighting, and morphology translates into exceptionally balanced performance. This is a paddle that you can trust across the full spectrum of the game, and you don't have to worry about compromising any one style of play because the paddle excels at something else. And a balanced, sensible paddle that stands out in its overall performance rather than just in power or control is a good spot to be in in today's market. So I'm happy to recommend the Shapeshifter to anyone that's looking for a paddle that sits squarely between power and control, doing most things well without veering off too far in any one direction. You can take $19 off the price of the Shapeshifter with the code John Q, bringing it down to $171. This is slightly more expensive than other comparable paddles, so $10 more than the 6-0 Double Black Diamond and $35 more than the J2K. The owner of Chorus told me that the increased cost comes from that triaxial 18K Torre carbon fiber surface, which he says is the most expensive option that was available to him but he loved how it performed, so he stuck with it. Now, I do think the claims for superior spin by Diadem on their 18K paddle were overblown, but it does seem to provide some performance perks for the Shapeshifter in particular, because it helps to soften the face and make it more muted on softer shots, while the harder shots become more lively when activating the fiberglass layer on the bottom. So it plays into the paddle's all-court performance. And that, is it. That's all I have to say about the shapeshifter, at least for now. But be sure to tune in to the podcast where Eddie and I will give updates as we get more experience with this paddle. And if you already have one, let me know your experience with it in the comments. As always, thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next video.